Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, colleagues. Um, my apology uh, for starting late. Uh, Ilya Graham and I had some technical glitches, so our apology and thank you for joining this uh, very the first uh, in our series on the distinguished uh, vice chancellor lecture uh, lecture series. Uh, this we uh, Rector Pretorius is hosting uh, this together with the co-hosting partners of the. Uh, DSI, uh, NRF, uh, Science and Technology, Food Security uh, Center of Excellence, and the Center for Humanities Research, our flagship in the humanities. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be able to, to welcome you uh, to this first series. Uh, and thanks, uh, firstly, to uh, our speaker, uh, Dean Ian Bokum, who is the um, Buckner Clay Dean of uh, Dean at the College of Graduate College and Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at Virginia University, and is a long-standing partner and close uh, comrade and friend of the university through uh, our Center for Humanities Research. Uh, Ian, thank you very much for hosting this. I'd like to uh, uh, invite uh, Rector Pretorius to make the opening remarks, and then I will hand over to. Uh, Heidi Kronenbaum, the director of the Center for Humanities Research, who will uh, chair, the, chair the session with some uh, response from uh, Prof. Julian May, and then we'll have some Q&A in the end. Uh, Prof. Pretorius, uh, welcome. And Ian, uh, thank you very much for uh, leading us on this first talk. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Umesh. Uh, Professor Ian Bocom, Dean of Arts and Sciences, and Professor of English at the University of Virginia, uh, UWC colleagues, uh, guests, uh, participants. I'm delighted to welcome you today to a conversation with Prof. Ian Bocom about his latest book, History Four Degrees Celsius. I had the pleasure of meeting Ian four years ago 
at a dinner at the Consortium of Humanity Centers and Institutes Conference in Cape Town. That evening, we had a really memorable conversation at the, about the importance of the traditions of freedom in the Black Atlant Atlantic, as well as the place of humanities at UWC. Ian challenged me in a friendly way about my statement that the humanities was a priority project for me. And I hope that his presence here today in the inaugural Vice Chancellor's annual lecture goes a little way in convincing him of my position. Moreover, our Great Moss Street project that will provide a facility for the humanities will be completed this year. And I hope that when the renovations is completed, Ian and other humanities scholars will find a welcome place for collaborative scholarly and research projects. Uh, we visited uh, Virginia uh, prior to COVID-19, and I'd like to thank Ian and the faculty uh, for their hospitality during our visit. Uh, finally, I would like to congratulate Ian on having established the Democracy Initiative with his colleagues at Virginia University. I look forward to his new book that will explore how universities can help tackle the rapid changes facing societies. This is certainly a subject very close to home. Ian, thank you for supporting UWC, not only the humanities, but the institution as a whole. I look forward uh, to remaining with you for a few minutes longer, uh, at least. Thank you very much, and uh, I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, thank you, uh, Rector Pretorius. I appreciate those words. Um, I will hand over to uh, Heidi Kronenbaum. Heidi, who is the director of the Center for Humanities Research, the flagship program on the humanities at the UWC. Heidi, uh, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Umesh. Um, and thank you, Prof Pretorius. Um, it gives me much pleasure to chair the Vice Chancellor's Distinguished Lecture presented today and inaugurated this year by Professor Ian Bocom. Over the past 15 years, through our commitment to an idea of post-colonial freedom, to freedom in the wake of apartheid, the Centre for Humanities Research set to work on revisiting foundational concepts in the humanities and interpretive social sciences to rethink ideas about the human in proximity to practices and archives of the arts through which it has been our contention, the unprecedented might emerge into view in relation to an idea of freedom adequate to our times. And this is one thread of uh, Prof Ian Bocom's concerns in his new book, History at Four Degrees Celsius. Indeed, the CHR's research platforms on citizenship and justice, becoming technical of the human and aesthetics and politics, share a number of the critical concerns that are raised in Ian Bocom's latest book. Under the leadership of the CHR's former director, Pramesh Lalu, one of the many achievements in our work was the hosting of the CHCI annual conference on the humanities improvised to which Prof Pretorius has just alluded. The CHCI of which Ian Bocom's also been president has been an extraordinary network for the Center for Humanities Research in establishing itself as an humanities research center in Africa oriented to the world. Out of it, collaborations between the CHR and University of Virginia's Institute of the Humanities and Global Cultures, directed by Debjani Ganguly, has seen two UVA scholars visiting us to work with the CHR's Laboratory of Kinetic Objects in our puppetry initiative in Barrydale, 
with the CHR's Chair in Aesthetic Theory and Material Performance held by Jane Taylor, visiting the Institute of the Humanities and Global Cultures at UVA and working in its laboratory projects. Another collaboration underway to which Prof Pretorius also referred is the CHR's Great Moor Street Initiative, which despite delays caused by the pandemic is now under construction and slated for us to move in later this year. Among the CHR's programs that will be housed at the Great Moor Street Initiative is its international partnerships, which we look forward to building further with University of Virginia. Let me introduce Ian Bocom. Professor Ian Bocom is the Buckner W. Clay Dean of the College and Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at the University of Virginia, appointed in 2014. Bocom came to UVA after serving 17 years at Duke University's Department of English as a professor and as director of the John Hope Franklin Humanities Institute. He's author of Out of Place, Englishness, Empire and Locations of Identity and Spectres of the Atlantic, Finance, Capital, Slavery and the Philosophy of History, a text that has been extensively engaged uh, in the CHR through our reading programs. And he's co-editor of Shades of Black, Assembling Black Arts in 1980s Britain. Bochum's latest book, History at Four Degrees Celsius, Search for a Method in the Age of the Anthropocene was published in August 2020 and places black studies into a thoughtful and much needed conversation with climate change. Under Bochum's leadership, the College and Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at UVA launched its new college curriculum to better prepare undergraduate students for 21st century lives building on the success of a three-year pilot program that attracted more than 1,900 university students. Bocom has partnered with colleagues across the university to form the Dem Democracy Initiative, among a number of new UVA programs with university leaders, addressing the many challenges and rapid change changes facing societies today. I'd like to welcome Ian to to present his talk. And I'll introduce Professor Julian May, my colleague at UWC, who will respond to the talk after we've heard from um, Ian Bocom. Over to you, Ian, thank you. Heidi, <clears throat> Heidi thanks um, so much um, to you for that generous introduction um, and to um, Umesh for pulling all of this together and deeply Rector Pretorius um, for your words and for being here. Um, I remember that dinner um, quite strikingly um, um, in 2017. Um, as um, many of you um, will know, um, uh, in August of 2017, a couple of days after that dinner, um, the city of Charlottesville, uh, where the University of Virginia is based, um, uh, was attacked by a white supremacist mob. Um, and um, I flew home, uh, Rector Pretorius, about two days after that dinner. Um, and one of the things that has been in my mind and was very much in my mind on that flight home to be with um, colleagues and students here um, was the legacy of what Western Cape has done and is doing um, to uh, commit itself as an institution uh, to the building of democratic culture and the pursuit of freedom. Um, and I have on a number of occasions um, uh, in trying to work with colleagues um, through um, the challenges um, that continue to um, wreck and break our society um, through the broken histories of racism uh, and race, uh, remember deeply uh, that conversation and what you've done. So it's really uh, an absolute honor to be here. Thank, thank you for inviting me. Um, when I spoke to Premesh, um, uh, uh, who's a, he's a dear friend and Umesh, uh, about this event a couple of weeks ago, they suggested that rather than giving a formal lecture, um, that what I do is talk about some of the key, the key ideas of the book, uh, knowing that some of you will have had a chance to read some of it, but I have no expectation that, um, that you will have read uh, all of it or, or perhaps uh, any of it. Uh, so the idea is that I'll, I'll try to sort of run through over about 20, 25 minutes, some of the key ideas of the book. Uh, and then say a few words about the next project that it's leading toward and, and then look forward, uh, Professor May, 
uh, to hearing uh, your your comments, and then hopefully we can just open things up for a good discussion. So most broadly, the goal of the book, and, and Heidi has alluded to this, um, is to think about the significance of two cycles of accumulation in the making of the modern world, uh, and to consider a method for putting those cycles into conversation and exchange with one another. Um, the first of those is uh, the cycle of capital accumulation, and it's allied practices of racial violence in the histories of slavery and colonialism across the Black Atlantic world from the 17th and 18th centuries through the present. And the second is the cycle of carbon accumulation over that same period of time, um, originating plausibly from the 1784 uh, invention of the steam engine, although that, that's really just a sort of a, a moment that you can point to, um, and the catastrophic climate change that carbon cycle is producing. Uh, the violence that it is wrecking on the planet as a whole, and the uneven exposure to that violence across the planet. An unevenness and intensified exposure to the violence of climate change, which as we learn more uh, about the impacts of climate change, uh, we see those uneven vulnerabilities mapping almost exactly onto the maps of empire. Ultimately put, the goal of the project, like um, uh, that um, of work pursued by many other scholars um, with whom I've been in conversation and uh, from whom I've learned immensely, is to think about the relationship between post-colonial Black and diaspora studies uh, and climate change. Um, or as one more way of putting it, it's to consider the connections between the Black Atlantic as a cultural, historical, and political zone and the Black Atlantic as a climate changed ocean. And to ask how those two Black Atlantics converge. Within the book, I try to encapsulate those questions in a formula which lends the title to the introduction that was shared with you um, by talking about um, what I call the dialectic of forces and forcings. The dialectical interplay of the historical forces of racial violence and empire and capital and the geophysical forcings, which is the technical name given to those um, uh, phenomena that generate and uh, contribute to and produce climate change in the epoch of the Anthropocene. Uh, sun flares, carbon accumulation, the orbital circuits of the earth around the sun. So trying to think that relationship between the force of history and the forcings of climate change. And to ask those questions with the idea that those forces and forcings are not independent of one another, but with the idea that the force of history, of capital history, of colonial history, is what has thrown us into the climate changed epoch of the Anthropocene. And with the understanding that the forcings of climate change continuously interact with the ongoing lived reality of those historical forces to exacerbate their effects and their damages. Um, if you've had a chance to look at the book, and Suzanne, can you go ahead and, and key up? Um, uh, there are a couple of images that, that, I, that I want to show. If you can go ahead and key those up, Suzanne. If you've had a chance to look at the book, you'll know that part of my effort is to keep thinking about those questions in relationship to an organizing set of images a series of photographs by the Ghanaian photographer Nyani Korma, collectively entitled, We Were Once Three Miles From the Sea. So you go ahead and go on to the next one. Collectively, those images show a series of coastal sites on the Ghanaian coast near a series of Atlantic slave factories, the dungeons where enslaved peoples were held before their forced migration and sale to the slave plantations in the Caribbean and the Americas. A series of sites that as you can see are now overwhelmed by climate driven ocean rise.
So the images are at the center of the book and in many ways provide the um, occasion to try to focus the theoretical concerns of the book um, within a, a set of aesthetic phenomena, um, photographic images um, that also bear witness to a particular historical place um, on the west coast of Africa um, that is also a place that was central to the capital economies of plantation slavery, um, a place that was central to that first cycle of capital accumulation with which I'm concerned, and a place where you can now begin to see the effects of the second cycle of carbon accumulation. Throughout the book, I'm trying to understand that interplay between the slave fort and the ocean rising sea and to ask how those images can help us understand our moment in relationship to Cormine's resonant title, We Were Once Three Miles From The Sea, how they can help us comprehend a we, both local and Ghanaian and planetary, that is no longer distant from the sea. A second broad goal of the book is to engage with the notion of the planetary as that plays out within practices of colonial and post-colonial critique, which have heretofore largely focused on questions of the global. And to do so with the proposition that the planetary is only apprehensible through the vernacular specificity of the global and the colonial and the post-colony. Or in Ashila Mbembe's terms, with the idea that to apprehend the planetary is to apprehend the becoming black of the planet, in his words. Or working with Ashil's thought to offer the suggestion that we come to the planetary through the post-colony shore, here through that Ghanaian beach. I'll return to that in the comments I wanna make regarding the next phase of the project in just a few minutes. The third key argument of the book is that to apprehend the relationship between the planet and the post-colony requires us to work simultaneously across multiple scales of time and multiple scales of analysis, uh, which I lay out um, along these lines. The biographical scale of the individual human life, of those singular lives on the shore, the nomological scale of states and societies and polities in which those singular lives are enmeshed. The biological scale of the history of the human species. The zoological scale of human life as just one form of life among, among many other non-human forms. The geological scale of the history of the planet and the cosmological scale of the history of the planet itself within the life of the universe. So at a certain level, the idea of the book is that to regard any of those images is to try to think them biographically, nomologically in relationship to the history of Ghana, biologically in relationship to the unfolding history of the human species, zoologically in relationship to the connections and relationships between the human species uh, and all forms of non-human life. The geological scale of the planet to see this not only as a Ghanaian space, but as a planetary space and a cosmological scale uh, to try to situate um, those locales uh, within the unfolding uh, not only decadal or centennial, but, but millennial timeframes, the thousand year timeframes of the life of the planet itself. The method in the subtitle of the book is the method of trying to think through all of those scales and of attempting to see them as entangled with one another rather than incommensurate with one another or cut off from one another. Even as those scales seem to break down along two broad lines, one, a humanist scale of time and analysis, the humanist scales of the individual life, 
the life of a nation or a polity and the life of the human species and a post-humanist scale of Zoe, life itself, and Geo, the planet and cosmos. From a methodological perspective, thinking that broad set of relationships, the relationship of a humanist and a post-humanist approach to race, capital, and climate change amounts, I argue, to thinking the connections and exchanges between a long-standing Marxist and neo-Marxist historical materialism, uh, which I call materialism one, and a more recent vibrant materialism of non-human actants associated, say, with the work of Jane Bennett or Bruno Latour or Tim Morton, um, but in the book I call materialism two. The last main objective of the book is to think about how those different but overlapping scales of analysis produce different but overlapping conceptions of the we. The we of who we are now, the we of who we were once, three miles from the sea, but no longer so, the we that the combined force of history and the forcings of climate change are leading us to be, the we of who we are individually in our lived cultural realities as a species and as planetary inhabitants. And its goal is to think about how those different passages through the we, and Heidi, this returns to your comments and the phenomenal work of the Humanities Research Center at UWC. Its goal is to think about how these different passages through the we produce differing but tangled accounts of freedom and of how it remains the task of critical thought to ask how that we can be free. Whether we approach that question from a humanist or a post-humanist guise. To answer that question, I finished the book by suggesting means that we must ask the question of freedom through a range of conceptions. First, through the enduring idea of a freedom from. Freedom from sovereign violence, freedom from arbitrary constraint. Second, by an equally long imagined freedom to. Freedom to health, freedom to education and self-fashioning and cultural production. And finally, by means of a newer conception of freedom, freedom toward, freedom toward the good of the locale and the good of the planet, freedom toward the blending of the good of the self with the good of the species and with the good of all life, life itself, life human and non-human. Freedom toward blending life that has been afforded some kind of legal protection and recognition with all that life that lacks standing. Life thrown away, life ignored, life non-human, life unrecognized. It's my overall sense that that is where the blend of post-colonial study and climate study leads us to a continued and renovated insistence on freedom from violence, freedom to fullness of being and freedom toward life that is held not to be part of our life but with whose local and planetary history and reality and future we are deeply entangled. As we are all entangled, whoever we are, however distant we are from the sea, with those lives standing at the edge of the slave trade shores and the rising oceans of the Black Atlantic, washing not only the globe, but the planet. That leads me to a final few brief words on where the project is headed. If it is the case that we come to the planetary present from the post colonies historical shore, how do we think not only about the historical past, which isn't in fact past, but endlessly present and accumulating and the claims it makes on us? How do we think not only about that non-past past, but also about the climate changed planetary future, which isn't in fact future, but already arriving and the claims that damaged future makes on us. I'm just starting to think about that and I don't have developed arguments, um, but here are a few initial thoughts or points of departure. The future is something we are already colonizing. The future and those who will live in it is already coming to us 
as an intensified version of the colony and the post-colony, damaged and wrecked by what we do now. But even as that already colonized future is already coming, already arriving, that future and those who live in it have no legal standing, no structure or form of protection or recognition, at least by the laws of sovereign nations. Instead, the climate future, the future of the planet and all those, and all those who will live in it comes to us as something objected, something disposable. It comes like the colonial subject before the imperial power of the present. Coming so, the future makes a claim on us, so that one of the key tasks of critical thought now is to understand how to situate ourselves in relationship to that future claim, much as we have toward history's claims. And as a final word, as I've begun to think about that, there is an enigmatic figure I've become aware of. The figure of the future claimant's representative. This is in fact a formal legal character, someone who the court appoints in mass tort, mass damage claims. Uh, say as an example, in a lawsuit against an asbestos manufacturer. When the court knows that while the damage of the asbestos has already been done, some of its victims are too young to yet fully experience the fullness of its violence in their bodies or to appear before the court to make their claim. So someone is appointed now to speak for them, the future claimant's representative. I've been wondering about what it might mean for us to consider ourselves so as the representatives now for future claimants, asking not only for damages in the future, but to restructure life now before all the damage is done. What might we gain from considering that to be one of the tasks of thought and the tasks of the university, to be both the past and the future's representatives? And what caution should we have? What dangers are there in imagining that role for ourselves? If, for example, we return to Edward Said's cautionary citation of Marx at the opening of Orientalism, they cannot represent themselves. They must be represented. How can we think about those future claimants and our responsibility toward them and the claims of that past without repeating that orientalizing mistake? And wrapping up, I want to say again that I truly cannot think of a more important place to consider those questions than the University of the Western Cape, which throughout its life has dedicated itself without fear to the questions of the we and the free, to a reckoning with the past and the present and the future and the task of the university. In Pramesh Lalu's words, to always asking what the university is for and how the university can and must be for the project of democracy and freedom locally and globally and planet-wide. It is a deep honor to be part in any small way of the University of the Western Cape's project. Um, thank you all very much for inviting me. Thanks. Thank you, Ian, for an incredibly forcefully um, thoughtful and important intervention and I, you, I, I, I think it's an incredibly important experiment also to um, have the kind of task that you've set for a critical humanities as a task to be thought together as a question for the university. Um, and with great, you know, great honor and delight, I want to um, put you into conversation with uh, Professor Julian May, um, who brings a very different but 
no less crucial piece of critical engagement to the, the burning questions um, that, that your book is, um, is asking us to think in, in its simultaneous in, in a kind of simultaneity. And the question of scale is one we can come back to. I'd like to introduce um, Professor May. Professor Julian May is director of the DSI NRF Center of Excellence in Food Security at the University of the Western Cape and holds the UNESCO chair in African food systems. He's an economist and has worked on options for poverty reduction, including public nutrition, land reform, social grants, information technology, and urban agriculture. He's published extensively and has served on international and national expert groups, as well as the South African Statistics Council and the Council of the Academy of Science of South Africa. The Center of Excellence in Food Studies is an initiative of the DSI NRA hosted by the, hosted by the University of the Western Cape and undertakes innovative research and critical inquiry to enable South Africa to tackle the challenges of food insecurity and nutrition, particularly investigating factors that contribute to food insecurity through transdisciplinary and collaborative research which recognizes the importance of drawing insights from the humanities, social sciences, and, national, and natural science, sciences, as well as stakeholders' knowledge to address the challenges that we face. So, Julian May, thank you. The Zoom floor is yours. Thanks very much, Heidi, and thanks very much, Ian. In a little while, I'm going to ask to share my screen, but it looks like panelists do have that possibility. So I'll come back to that. Ian, my colleagues will be aware that when they asked me to be a, a, a respondent, I approached it with some terror um, because although my wife is an artist and my brother a photographer, my mother was an author, I am the black sheep of the family. I'm, an, I'm, an, I'm a quantitative economist, but I have had the privilege for the last maybe six, seven years to lead um, a center of research that focuses on food and food security. And in dealing with a subject like food, you cannot sidestep the issues that you've raised, issues of what is happening to the food system um, as a result of changes in climate, what the food system itself causes in terms of climate change and its impact upon the environment, how the food system in the past was created by, as you said, plantation slavery or dispossession as it is in the case of South Africa. Um, the incredible violence of the food system itself, um, a system which is both appealing because we enjoy food um, and repulsive because when we think about the viscosity of producing food, many of us really don't want to come to terms with how our food is produced. So I think there's a, a distinct overlap in one part of the work that we do. As you spoke, there's a second overlap, which I guess hadn't really occurred to me. And it, it came from when you were talking about thinking about the future and you made a comment um, that the future is already here. And you also made a comment about how to represent those that cannot represent themselves. Now that rang a very distinct chord with me because we have just concluded a five year research project within the center where we've been grappling with a particular issue of South African, of the South African environment. And that is the frankly disgraceful situation that our children remain undernourished to the point that they are stunted. In other words, they do not, they get so little nourishment that they do not reach their full physical capacity um, and are likely not to reach their full cognitive and creative capacity because they are short, they do not get the food they need. Disgraceful because it's been like this for the last two decades. Despite all the policies, despite the rhetoric, we've not moved in the situation of our children. 
in that publication, and that's a, it's a download that can be reached at the Children's Institute from the University of Cape Town, who are our collaborators. In that publication, we've taken the term from the climate change researchers of slow violence, recognizing that like climate change is a slow violence, when, it, when our children are put in the position of extreme malnutrition, it too is a slow violence, largely unseen, largely unremarked upon, um, permanent and irreversible. And so we picked up on that notion of slow violence and carried it throughout the report, asking different kinds of researchers in the social sciences, physical sciences, and in, in the humanities to reflect upon what are the acts of violence that we are committing towards the future? Because by stunting our children, and these are very young children, we are indeed immediately impacting upon the future. The book includes an input from our colleagues in the Center for, Center for uh, Critical Food Studies, who are looking specifically at the role of an actor that is deeply interested in children, the corporate food sector and how the corporate food sector is advertising towards children and what they advertise so that our children are not only stunted, they are overweight because the food that is made available for, that is cheaply available in South Africa and more importantly, that is available, available in poor areas is food that is obesogenic, high in sugar, high in fat, high in salt, satisfying, because it's of all those things, um, but nonetheless, something which causes children to be sated, but not nourished. So I think there's a, a strong resonance in when we think about the work that UWC is doing around food systems, and possibly our, it's interesting that our former Vice Chancellor, Archbishop Desmond Tutu, at a very early stage coined the expression that the reason why we have hunger in South Africa is not that there's not, not enough food, but because the food system is broken. Um, it's a term that's become very popular now, but this was termed, I think, by Archbishop Tutu about 30 years ago, um, acknowledging that a system itself can lead to these kinds of, of these acts of violence. So I found your comments of freedom from and freedom to of direct relevance to the work that we're doing. Now, the Center for Critical Food Studies is a very interesting part of our center. It's interesting because the funding we received from our National Research Foundation back in 2014 did not provide for the humanities. Um, it provided for more work in science, it was very interested in work around food safety, um, obviously worried about climate change, um, and obviously worried about whether people could afford food, but did not pay attention to the fact that without an understanding of who consumes what and why, and I, I think your notion of forces and forcings, um, again, I found very appealing because without understanding the, force, the forces and forcings of the food system, um, which I think really does require the humanities, I believe we would have been blind over the last couple of years. We were fortunate in that as this project started, the Mellon Foundation visited the UWC and indicated firstly their willingness to broaden their funding of UWC and the fact that they would only fund the humanities. And I, I put to them, would you consider humanities and food? And they said, most definitely. And fortunately, colleagues, both in our women and gender studies department and in our theology department and in our critical writing department stepped up to the plate. And once we raised the grant, we were able to run with it. I'm going to try and share my screen now. You should be able to see a poem. Yes? Yes. Wonderful. So 
among the projects that we funded, and I think sometimes to the puzzlement of our steering committee who, who comprise nutritionists and agricultural economists and agri agricultural scientists, was to encourage young scholars to, in a, a creative writing program, to write poetry about hunger. Um, we also commissioned a satirical play about food. Um, interesting, the play reached over 4,000 4, people within two weeks. I doubt that I've ever been able to get 4,000 people to read my own work in two weeks. So we really managed to communicate to a lot of people. This is just one example, but I wanted to highlight this poem by Jolene Phillips. Uh, Jolene is the daughter of a, of a Fisher family in the Western Cape. The Fisher families had been very badly affected by, I think what you talked about as the, as the changed ocean of the Atlantic. And she writes here a poem which talks about, I think many things, as the fish disappear, what happens to those who are dependent upon fish as their livelihood, what it means to be a parent unable to feed your children, what are the risks of eating food and why do people take those risks even though the food may require means that they must eat it with access to bread in case they choke on a bone. And ultimately that line right at the end that even the rotten fish is a reminder that my father has failed us, talks to that enduring legacy of poverty carrying on even to someone like Jolene, who's in the photograph down there. I think she's now doing her PhD, um, who's managed, I think, to break free of the poverty of her family, but and now still is moved by this sufficiently to write a poem about it. I presented this poem at a workshop organized by UNESCO in Palmer, where they released the Palmer Declaration on Food. Um, and the Palmer Declaration recognizes both the importance of local food systems and the, the multiple things that we expect our food system to produce. Food itself, um, ro robust and lively rural communities, and ultimately environmental sustainability. Um, I was really surprised by how many people came up afterwards and said, this one poem encapsulates all we are doing when we try to teach food studies at a university. So I'll end with this because I think what your work has highlighted, at least for me, is how to think about how, how feedback takes place when we do the most fundamental act of consuming food. Um, an anthropologist I like very much, Upandurai, talks about food as a highly condensed social fact. So how that impacts upon us and how that I think would be at risk of that violence of climate change and how that risk is already with us and that we're already seeing slow violence against those that are not represented. And in my case, that concern particularly is the children. So thank you very much for your really um, striking presentation. Um, I changed my background from my home and I thought as you were talking, the, the library of at, Tutan, at uh, Timbuktu might be a more appropriate venue to, for me to be able to give these thoughts. Um, thank you. I'll end my show now and stop sharing. Thanks, Heidi, I'm done. Thanks, Julian. Um, I think this was a wonderful uh, kind of illustration of the ways in which the method that uh, Ian's book is challenging us to pursue might be in conversation across scales and across instances of the micro, the local, the particular, but that each kind of instance in a way radiates um, and throbs with the sense of the need to engage at multiple scales. And so I, I think 
before, uh, there, there are a number, thank you very much, Julian. Um, I, I think it, it's a hugely important obligation that we set ourselves to speak across um, and, uh, and in the interstices of the spaces that are distributed through discipline and through faculty in the universities. And it's a question that, uh, I, you know, we, uh, it would be interesting to hear Ian reflect on later. But I would like to offer Ian an opportunity to um, reflect or respond on, on your response, if you would like, Ian, before I uh, engage some of the questions that people have, have put out on the chat. Absolutely. Um, thanks, Heidi. And Julian, thank you. Um, that was incredibly thought provoking. Um, and thank you also for sharing that poem, um, which I need to read um, and think and think carefully about. A couple things, two or three things that, that, that struck me and, and maybe picking up on Heidi's point um, about the, the question about the connection with the disciplines and, and then one, one or two others. I actually can't imagine a better um, person to, um, uh, to hear from um, than someone in the empirical social science as someone who's working on uh, on food and food security issues. Um, you you mentioned that link between forces and forcings. Um, and one of the ways, although I don't talk about this in the book, one of the ways that I've sort of been thinking about it subsequently became clear to me in, in your comments. Um, in the story about um, the initial funding for the center and then the conversation that you had with the Mellon Foundation, how that was able to bring different branches of the university together. Um, one, of the, um, one of the paradigms that universities are increasingly setting for themselves as they establish their strategic purpose, their strategic vision and mission, and then therefore their resource allocation, uh, as we all know, uh, is to um, coordinate the, the mission of the university in relationship to this idea of global grand challenges, right? And that, that's been something that has been circulating and is showing up in virtually every university strategic planning, including our own. One of the errors that I think that occurs, I, I think taking on the notion of social and global challenges, I endorse, but one of the errors that sometimes occurs is that the challenge presents itself on the university's horizon of legibility to the extent that it's quantifiable. And that if it's not quantifiable, it can fall out of attention. And I think food security and insecurity is one of those things where, where you see, you, you see the, 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 the urgency of the quantifiable, right, of the measurable of that to which we can put data, right? That would, that which we can empirically understand where you can really see the different kinds of economic and other interventions make a difference. Um, but sometimes the focus on the, the, the um, what is amenable to data and quantification um, loses the power of that poem and loses the, the, the life, each individual young child's life. Um, the forces forcing piece is in some ways um, a call to say to universities or just to me, you know, someone maybe in my dean role, um, we have to pay attention to the forcings, which are things we can measure, and we have to pay attention to the forces, which are things that we have to interpret and understand. And that dialectic of forces and forcings is also in my mind a call for how universities can be thinking. And, and again, so to, to be in conversation you know, with a quantitative economist, but with whom I have the sense that there's a shared sense of the urgent purpose of the university. It's, it's just a, it's a gift. So a thought to throw out is what, how do we think about those challenges in relationship to what can be metricalized, datafied, quantified? We have to do that. But what, what we miss when we do that? And how does the food security food system work help us think about that? That's a sort of a, a first one. Um, get back to that very briefly in a second. The second point, um, talking about children, um, as I'm starting to think about this next phase of the project, um, there are a lot of these movements that I'm sure you're aware of about um, future generations 
right? The, the politics of future generations and, and, how, and how we take what we've learned about our relationship to past generations, prior generations, right? And bring some of the force of that energy critique to thinking about future generations. And one of the dilemmas of future generations um, uh, is that um, for the most part, future generations have no legal standing. The law does not recognize the future generation. Um, you'll know as a quantitative economist that one of the one of the impact of this is something called the um, I think it's called the discount rate, right? You discount the, the future value of life, and the future generation has an incredibly high discount rate, right? Um, you can't measure it, and, and because the future future life has an incredibly high discount rate, you don't have to factor it into macroeconomic or other uh, economic policy decision making factors, right? And one reason is there's, there's no stand. So the, the, ch the child is, is that emblem, I think that, that the first emblem of the future generation, right? And th they're, which it, they're living the past in their future generation. And that, so thinking that, and then how, how far out do you push that, right? The life of the child, the life of, you know, a hundred years from now. So that, that's a huge question. Uh, and again, if you think food systems, right? So how do we think about the future generations and, and to see are there ways in which we can, we can um, both in the law and then in our practices of thought provide standing right, for future generations. The last, and then I'll, I'll wrap with this, is um, uh, one of the things that strikes me as so important both about Western Cape and, and Western Cape situatedness um, is the founding, the founding violence of the Van Riebeck years. Uh, and there's an allegory that I have in, in my head that I haven't quite been able to parse out. But what I think was the allegory of the castle and the garden. And that there were two forms of violent power that pro were projected. The violence of the castle and incarceration, uh, torture, law, death, and the violence of the garden. Um, there's this great book by I.L. Weitzman called The Conflict Shoreline, which is trying to think this relationship between climate change and, and colonialism and, and the way in which um, climate change is a form of colonialism. That part, one of the practices of colonialism is the, is the changing of the, of, the, of the climate, and it begins with food system production. So I, I, I don't have a whole lot to think about that, but that, that link, right, and how central the Cape is to that 400 year story, right, of the power of the castle. And the power of the garden uh, uh, is something I relish the chance to think more about. Okay, I've got on for too long. So just a, a couple of initial thoughts. Great, thank you, Ian. I mean, I, I think I think your um, your kind of acute sensibility of uh, the the problem of the Cape and its inheritances is is spot on and. It's compounded by the extent to which the history of slavery has shaped the present. Uh, the only city on the continent where slaves were brought to build the, the, the colonial city. So I, I think that, um, that this conversation is kind of staged between um, between here and the Ghanaian citing as an exemplar um, for your thought and yourself is 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 very important. Um, it, it it also extends a certain kinds of histories from the Atlantic into the Indian Ocean because um, and and in that um, a kind of geographical imaginary that exceeds you know that does the kind of work you're asking for. Um, I'm going to, um, cognizant of time, uh, I'm going to take a few comments and questions uh, from the, the chat box. I would have been interested to invite, uh, to invite Julian to, to respond to, to, to your response, but I think we might have to um, commit to a sense of hope in the future, which is, and at a different scale to think, um, temporalities also in light of pandemic and uh, and commit to engaging in the seminar room face to face, I, I, you know, and rather than this much impoverished form of interaction. Um, 
Uh, Heidi, sorry, but maybe Julian can respond if, if you think uh, we have enough time. We have enough time. If you think Julian uh, can respond a little bit and then we can hand over to you. I'll, I'll ask um, Julian to come in towards the end. I think there's some, you know, there are questions from colleagues here and abroad, which, um, you know, I, I would like to invite those voices in for the moment, uh, Umesh. Um, and then I'll return to Ian and Julian when we wrap up. Um, thank you. Um, so there was a comment from, um, let me have a look, from Ntokozo Luandle um, regarding acts of violence and um, and speaking about the curriculum content at universities and asking for a reflection on the relation between violence and curriculum, uh, including in the environmental sciences as discipline and as a program. Um, and, and given, you know, Ian's interests and commitments in, at UVA, I think this is a really an interesting, uh, an interesting intervention. Um, Pramesh Lalu, um, may, I, may I collect a couple of questions, Ian? Would that be okay? Okay. Pramesh Lalu says, thank you very much, Ian. This is a truly wonderful development on Spectres of the Atlantic. My question derives from a study about the mythic precursors of race that underwrote apartheid in South Africa. Do you have any suggestions on how we might relate questions of speculation in capital to the problem of undoing the legacies of race? How might a shift in method enable a program of undoing the legacies of the racial formations in our, of racial formations in our modernity? Um, James Chandler put a question, I think, I think that's quite a, and there's also a question from Jack Chen. Um, perhaps I should ask you Ian to respond to Ntokozo, uh, uh, Ntokozo's comment and uh, Premesh's question, and then I'll move to the next two questions, which are equally substantial. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, on the curricular question, you know, broadly, I mean, what I can say is yes. Um, and, and, and I mean, first, just to talk about curriculum per se, right? And the and the importance of of curriculum. And you know, Heidi, um, you know, two two words: that, you know, the, the seminar and the curriculum. And obviously, uh, curriculum includes the seminar. Um, but so much of what we do, um, so much we do, even even in the pandemic, even even in the Zoom form, is this incredibly invigorating set of exchanges between those of us who, for one reason or another, have have had you know through struggle or through advantage the privilege of continuing to be at the university for our careers, um, and and that's what we do, and that, that's where, where, where thought you know thought gets pushed. It's, it's crucial, um, but the university is a space for curriculum um, and and thinking about and really. Uh, among others, undergraduate curriculum, right? First curriculum. I just think it is so important and, and that the, the curriculum become a space, right? Of experimentation uh, and innovation. The curriculum become a space um, where, we, where we think about how to organize. Um, uh, again, Julian, to sort of um, you know, go back to, to, to your points, right? That, that you want students to think about the violence within the food system from that moment of departure and not have to wait until say a postgraduate year to begin to kind of put some of those pieces together. Um, so I just thank you for for raising for raising curriculum um, uh, issues. Uh, I, I won't riff on what we've done, but we've just redesigned our undergraduate curriculum. We hadn't done it in 50 years, um, and one of the um, one of the predicates of that redesign is that any urgent question and any any work that that um, undergraduate liberal arts education can do to contribute to a sense of education for democracy, which, which is a, a conception like behind what we, we wanted to do. It's gonna require students to think about some very complicated questions from at least four different angles simultaneously. Um, 
to act to think empirically right to actually have a deep understanding of the empirical basis the fact-based questions the scientific understanding yeah, to, again say take climate change or take the food system right what, what what are the empirical facts of load um a second is is that to then really think about what are the ethical claims that emerge from that understanding um a third and doing this sort of goes again to the citation of the poem is that any truly urgent question and, and any question that is that is grounded in um, both the ongoing lived reality and practice of violence, the experience of violence, um, is one that um, is fully apprehensible, um, not only through the sciences, um, but through the, the affective immersion um, with a work of art. Uh, that art is not decoration, right? That, I mean, we know this, right? But, but that we say that to students right away, right? That you, to understand the food system, you need to, you need to read that poem. Um, and then, um, uh, and then, to think about the ways in which, um, as a fourth part of it, um, how do we then democratically debate with one another? What therefore should we do? Um, and not dictate to one another. What therefore should we do? Um, and so that that's a, a piece of it. But um, so not much to add beyond that, but but to say that I, I do think that that education in the urgent, right, and, and in the urgent um, practice of democratic life um, um, has to receive curricular embodiment, and then the curriculum has to be this constant face of change. Pramesh, my dear friend, thank you for your question. Um, uh, I wish I could, I wish I could be there um, with you. Okay, uh, as always, a, a complex, um, uh, incredibly thoughtful, um, Question. So two things maybe on speculation, uh, speculation capital um, uh, and race. So I'm repeating myself a little bit, but if there's a connection between the, the Spectre of the Atlantic book, which for those, it's on the relationship between finance, capital and slavery um, and this, this new project, the point where those two projects come together is that both systems, the climate system and the speculative finance system, generate and um, depend on the production of life that doesn't have standing, right? Disposable life, right? In, in finance capital, life that is insured that you can throw away and drown and generate capital revenue from life that you drown, right? Because the life itself doesn't have standing, it only has speculative value. And, in climate life that is immaterial, life that is ignored, life life that is objected. Um, so there's a there's a space of connection between them. Um, the link then that um, and again this is just drawing on the work of multiple scholars, yours included, um, is to say that that life though is not completely abstract. That life has a history, and that life is raced. Right? It's not an accident that disposable life is raced life. Um, it's constitutive, right? To the disposability of life, uh, and this is where Shield's recent work on um, from the critique of Black Reason um, and other material as to say that even as we begin to think about this whole question of species, right, the movement from the human to the, to the species, species is raced. Right? We, we come to species. We come. We come to. We come to. We come to these questions through race. Um, uh, and what that means, and and um, just people read Premesh's work. Um, is with that in mind that the archives and the repertoires for thinking the, the future of raced life and disposable life, the archives and the repertoires come um, not exclusively, but, but significantly, overwhelmingly significantly from um, the politics of race in the post colony. Right? That, that's, I just think that's where you, that's where you look, right? To, to see what, what, what those repertoires have been. So the kinds of work that you've been doing, right? The, the handspring work, right? The kinetic object work, the ideas that you've had about the emergence of the unprecedented, right? Um, that passage through, we are not after, um, we're, not, we're not after. Um, so that, that's just sort of one, um, uh, one brief thought. Don't wanna to go too long. Um, I, I did see Jim's question in the chat, which is a complex one, and I'll turn to that in a second. But um, uh, Heidi, back back over to you. But um, thank you both for us. 
um, thanks for that. They, 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 some pretty thick and important questions, um, conceptually thick, and I really appreciate uh, you taking time in to to really kind of work through the granularity of of them. Um, there, I'll I'll read I'll read James. Uh, uh, wait, where is James Chandler? James Chandler's question. Um, who acknowledged you for a wonderful condensation of, of your book. Um, I have a question about theory from the North South. You didn't reflect on the origins of your subtitle, Search for a Method. Your embrace of the idea of temporal scales comes from Levi Strauss's critique of Sartre's famous book, Search for a Method, best-selling work of philosophy in past century. Levi Strauss said the problem with Sartre's me method was that he didn't understand that he was working on disjunctive temporal scales. You say your scales are not disjunctive, but interactive. Where does that leave your own method in, rela in relation to Sartre, the powerful theorist from the North? Thanks, Jim. Um, much appreciated. Uh, so um, uh, Jim, is a, Jim is, is a dear friend, so Jim, really, really appreciate your being on the call. Uh, I'll try to do this fairly rapidly um, with a caveat that, that as is often the case with these things, there's a gap between my writing of the book <laughs> and the current moment where, that I'm in now, so I'll be a little bit less crisp than, than in the text itself. So yeah, um, uh, Sartre's um, critique, Levi Strauss' critique of Sartre is that in Search for Method, he doesn't, um, uh, he doesn't understand um, that the time scales within which he is trying to situate any particular event or phenomena and the circumstance, the external circumstances that, that have a determinative impact on it, right? which is kind of part of the project um, uh, of the, um, the critique of dialectical reason. Right? That, that's sort of what's doing, and, and search is, is, the, is the method uh, piece of that. Um, is that um, what Sartre doesn't understand, um, say, say you take the image, those, one of those West, West African images, right? that the, the image and the moment exist within a series of disjunctive scales that belong to different time series, right? Um, and uh, a lot of the, what I've ended up doing with the time series of the biographical life, right? The time series of the life of the nation is really kind of taken from um, Levi Strauss's observation, which is saying that any of, any of those young lives we see there, there's the biographical scale, right? Um, that's one order. Then there's the scale at the time of the post-colony in general, right? Then there's the scale, which is decades. Then there's the scale of imperial time, right? Which is centuries, right? Then there's the scale of something that you might want to call modernity, right? And they don't all line up. Things are, things are sitting in, in different scales at once, right? So that, that's the first thing he says. He doesn't recognize that. He just blends them together. The second um, part of um, Levi Strauss's um, critique of Sartre is that Sartre only pays attention to his score, historical scales of time. He doesn't think of what um, uh, Levi Strauss calls the infrahistorical and the superhistorical. The infrahistorical is like neurological scales, synaptic scales, the scale of the brain, right? the scale of cognition. And superhistorical, and, and this is, you know, he talks about geological time, right? All of the, all of the attention we've been paying in anthropic stuff, to, it's a, he doesn't do that. So that's the, that's the critique. Where, where I end up um, uh, in the book is that I agree with the first observation that, that Sartre's method lacks attention to the multiplicity of those scales. So I'm trying to kind of take that from Levi Strauss. What I end up taking from Sartre though is um, his proposition um, that you can, you can imagine a totality, right? a total combination where there are different heterogeneous elements that have to relate to one another in some sense. Right? And it's because he's continuing to think dialectically, right? This is his encounter with, with Morris. So I, what I sort of end up with is kind of a, 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 Levi, a Levi Straussian start is my short version of the answer for you. <laughs> so it, it deserves a longer response, but uh, that's, that's the short version of it, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Ian. Um, I'm going to take the question from uh, CHR colleague Moritz van Wever Donker, framing the planetary as that which we, in inverted commas, come to 
through the shores of the post-colonial is to acknowledge the planetary in a sense as a gift. As Césaire taught us, the burning or becoming black of the world was always already the condition of possibility of the modern. So a methodological question perhaps, I won't ask how we in inverted commas could ever accept this gift, doing justice to the gift rather, can the university think its method alongside this gift? Uh, right, um, great, Anna, am I unmuted? Great question, and by the way, I've been, I've been reading some of your work recently, um, so thanks, that, that great, um, uh, I think it's Kronos, the um, What is the University in Africa for essays um, have, have been really important. So let me try to answer as best I can through some of uh, what, I've, what I've been reading of, of, of your work. Um, and maybe just pause, first of all, to say I mean, a great point about the gift, right? And, and the idea maybe of a poisoned gift and how, how do you think about a poisoned gift that, that, that might not be, or, or a gift that comes to you through, um, through, through, through the poisoning, right? Uh, the poison. um, so this great edited collection of essays that also exists in relationship to some of Premesh's work, what is the university for? What is the university in Africa for? Um, and how might thinking the planet help the university think its task? Um, what might it mean to say that the university is for uh, not only democracy, but the idea of planetary democracy? Just as, as one thought, right? Uh, if, if, the, if the concept of the planet that we come to the planet the post-colony, um, what might it mean to say that the university is for planetary democracy? Well, one, one way to think that in relation to we come to the planet through post-colony is to say any answer to that question is only apprehensible if the university as global phenomena comes to an answer of its purpose through the post-colony. But as a first step, right? The, 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 the future of asking the question of what the university is for is a question that is gonna be asked from the global south. I mean, so that, that's a, I just think it's a proposition that, that I, I think is, is vital. Um, uh, and much of the work that you and colleagues here have been doing. Um, is there a gift in shifting the, the register, the scale to planetary democracy? And here, one of the things that I would point to is the debate between Paul Gilroy and Achille Mbembe on the notion of the planetary, right? So for Paul, who's been writing about the idea of a planetary humanism, um, um, Gilroy continues to really want to think the planetary in relationship to, um, uh, it's almost like a kind of a scaled up version of the global, right? Thinking, uh, thinking a human, a humanism that is planet wide, right? Post global in the sense that um, because it's focused on migration, uh, immigration, flight, right? Not on nation to sovereign borders. Mbembe's been thinking about the planetary in a, in a much more post humanist sense, right? He's been thinking about the planetary as. Um, um, not only human life, but non-human life, right? We only have one planet. Uh, and so one of the gifts, I think, of the planetary is figure. And again, this is, you know, lots of people besides me have been thinking about this, right? Um, is to, to, to kind of push up or to add a level of complexity to some of the other older terms that we have that we thought about. So go back then to democracy, right? We thought it might be about a humanist democracy, right? Which democracy has been, uh, so, and maybe they thought about, but it's a post-humanist democracy, the democracy of the human and the non-human world. Um, how do you think those? Adding the, adding the apparition of the planet, um, I find a potentially appealing way for the university to think its purpose, but only, only if it continues to do what I tried to do in this book, I mean, it's what I think, but you still have to think from the specific, from the vernacular, from the, the grounded, you know, again, I need to go back from the Cape, right? What does that question look like from the Cape? Um, so um, a bit abstract and wandery, but um, uh, that, um, that's, what, that's what I've been trying to um, 
puzzled my way through that very specific phrase. What would it mean if the university is for the idea and the project of planetary democracy? Thank you, Ian. What a remarkable challenge for us to think together with. Um, and one that hopefully would bring you to, um, to our cape, this cape here, <laughs> um, <laughs> to, to, to engage more kind of um, sharply on. Um, there are a number of questions, um, but I'm aware that um, it's late on our side and I guess your morning has, um, has blossomed into near midday. Um, there, there are two questions, uh, there, 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 there are questions from a couple of colleagues here um, that I'd like to raise. What I'm going to do is read the questions and then ask you to kind of winnow from them uh, a couple of overlapping threads that might would would that would that be okay with you? Yes, absolutely. And and I do then need to return to the the, the drudgery of my bureaucratic life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad I'm contributing to a good cause uh, in saving you from that. <laughs> um, Okay, so there's one question I'm going to pay um, Debjani Ganguly and um, and Shai Gortler, and both in different ways ask uh, ask questions about in relation to your argument and how they land, how it lands when thought of from different localities. Um, so Debjani is asking, is the Black Atlantic lens legible to planetary experiences of those who are engaging in climate change, for example, in, um, in Asia, South Asia, Bangladesh, India, Pacific Islands. Um, and differently, but in, in a way kind of uh, straddling the two materialisms, which you, um, I think, very usefully don't place into a kind of relationship of succession um, a, 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 in, in how you're thinking of them, um, is the question from Shai Gortler about the relation between the agency um, for future human generations and the agency that some First Nations and Native American scholars propose in um, epistemologies that perceive so-called natural objects um, or subjects, let's say rivers, mountains and trees as agentic um, in and of the, worthy of respectful treatment in and of themselves, regardless of human futurity. Um, Having in mind here uh, Glenn Coulthard's discussion of grounded normativity uh, as place-based epistemology that stands in tension with the time-based Western epistemologies um, and Winona LeDuc's recent advocacy in relation to the Pipeline 3 project, um, uh, uh, securing recognition of the agency of rivers. Um, in a related vein, um, well, maybe, let me, yeah, maybe you can just address those two questions and then I can pair Jane Taylor and, um, and, and, and Herman Wittenberg's question um, and then wrap up if that's okay. That sounds great, thanks. So first, it would be great uh, if uh, there, the questions in the, the chat are phenomenal and actually a lot of the references are great. So if, if there's like an archive of this, I'd be, I really, I'd really value it. Um, so Shai, Deb, Deb Johnny, thanks, thanks for questions. I'll see if I can answer them briefly in, in relate, maybe in relationship to one another. Um, uh, so Shai, the, um, the idea of life without standing that I'm starting to think through, let me, let me, let me um, give proper credit to how this came to me. It's from reading um, a recent novel by Kim Stanley Robinson. Uh, called the Ministry of the Future. So let me just kind of uh, say that. And, and the idea is that there is a UN agency that has established um, the conceit of the fiction. There's a UN agency that is established following a catastrophic heat wave in India. 
um, in which an agency is established to represent the future, right? Um, that's that's the conceit, and, there, and there's a lot of really interesting discussion of the notion of life without standards. I just want to name that. Um, to the life without standing, and, and then say future generations, um, absolutely part of what I've been thinking about are the multiplicity of form, forms of life without standing, right? Um, uh, the life, um, the life as you said, rivers, mountains, and trees. Um, and then maybe a specific example of this that connects to Johnny, thanks for your question, um, wonderful colleague, um, to thinking the Black Atlantic, but not uh, also thinking about other histories. So um, uh, the Yamuna River in, uh, in India, um, uh, which is one of the two great rivers in India and that flows, and, and Debjani knows this. Um, uh, Debjani is a colleague at, at, at UVA and we've done some work on, on this together. The Munas River that flows um, uh, through much of the subcontinent and it flows through Delhi. And by the time it gets to Delhi, it is, um, as I understand it, technically biologically dead. Uh, uh, it, it is so polluted that, it, that the water is dead and, and the water therefore um, cannot contribute and Julian in some ways this goes to sort of food system work right it can't it can't contribute to um, uh, human health so there are projects underway to uh, to try to um, uh, restore the river revive the river and one of the key steps that was required to do that was for the river to acquire legal personality that the river would have standing and that the river, in effect, would have rights. Now, there are dilemmas that one could bring to that, like you're projecting a kind of a humanist conception of rights onto right, a non-human entity. Um, but in effect, the river, the river was something that acquired standing. And once the river acquires standing, um, it, then it, it requires a capacity to be to operate, you know, within kind of sovereign legal systems. So I'm, I'm very interested in in that. And Debjani, to the point that that uh, you're raising. You know what that might mean is there might be analogies between the notion of a post colony or an archipelago of post colonies. Um, uh, where there, there are these commonalities, but it, it, it's all paying attention to the specificity of the vernacular right the, the particularity of the Yamuna. Um, and maybe the relationship between the Yamuna and um, uh, the, 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 the Atlantic shore. They're both bodies of water. They're both bodies of water that whose whose life uh, is is being um, ruinously changed by climate change. But the relationship between those bodies of water, and then the particular imperial, colonial, post-colonial histories of the communities around them, are not identical to each other. Right. So, to, so there's there's comparison, and and this then gets into a lot of our thinking about how we think about the notion of the comparative, broadly speaking. Right. What what's the value for comparison? So, all right. That was a longish answer, but thank you for both. Yes, to, uh, to both briefly. Okay. Heidi, you're muted. Thank you. Um, so, last round. Um, Ridwan Musaji, colleague in history, is interested in the relationship. Is 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 interested in the question of the future as that which is already always present and which is to come, and wondering if thinking race and capital. Um, within and around and contouring such, such time, whether there's a risk of collapsing race and cat capital that might provoke rethinking time and the work of history in accounting for race and capital. And I, I think that's very much a question about the limits of history as it's kind of, and, and what your, how your project is perhaps breaching or working at those limits. Um, I'm going to hitch that to, um, uh, I hope I haven't missed questions and, uh, you know, colleagues are welcome to come, come after me after the, after the talk. Um, from a colleague, Herman Wittenberg, who's interested in uh, the current surge to enclose commonly shared freely exchanged goods as private. How does this ri the rise in digital goods erode the value of natural environments, species and places? And on a slightly kind of uh, obliquely related question, um, Jane Taylor says she was 
struck by my observation we faced with burning questions that and that reminds us about the continuities in your work in Spectres uh, as a study of persons lost at sea um, and thinking about persons lost at land the extractive logics of mining the pursuit of fuel which entails a diversion from the question about the rights and privileges of cultivation of food what happened when we distributed the activities of planting between segments of societies? It's thinking about the failures of some of the Soviet and Chinese agricultural um, practices and wondering how questions of modernity and cultivation are mutually excluded or can be mutually exclusive. The food versus fuel dilemma, in other words, that faces us all. These are such big questions. Um, and, and I, I don't want to kind of pressure you to, to do justice to them. Um, so perhaps to draw out uh, some, some closing thoughts, uh, Ian. Um, mm -hmm. and, 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 and use that to you know, entice colleagues to, to get the book um, with, in anticipation of a follow-up. Discussion. Thanks. Uh, yeah, my brain is probably a little too tired to do those questions justice because they, they really are they're phenomenal and complex. Let, let me try to take a very quick pass through them if, if I can. So on time and the danger of um, uh, the convergence of race and capital, but as I understand it, there's much a question about the nature of history and the status of history uh, within our thinking about, uh, about time. You know, just, I just essentially would say yes to that and, and it, it returns to but one of the arguments that I'm trying to make in the book, and this, this reverts to Jim, Jim Chandler's question about Sartre and Levi-Strauss, is, is to pay very particular attention to the limits of the historical and history, if the historical and history are indexed to the human exclusively as providing the outer perimeter um, for, um, for critical thought, right? The critical thought can cocoon itself within the historical and, and part of uh, Strauss's, uh, Levi Strauss's critique and then part of what I want to pick up in and, and um, yeah, as you mentioned in the, the newer materialisms is to think about the post or the extra or the infra or the supra or the non-historical and what it means for us to inhabit non-historical time, right? planetary time, uh, other forms of time. So um, uh, the critique of history is in this with that said, though, um, uh, where in the book I disagree with someone like Deepesh Chakrabarty, or at least as I understand some of Deepesh's most recent work, um, is uh, it's a critique of the limits of historical thinking, but not, Deepesh doesn't say this, okay, so this is like a, a not, it'd be unfair, uh, it'd be unfair to say uh, that this is what, what's being argued, um, but not to take from that, therefore we need to move beyond what the disciplines of history have taught us. Right. Hold those, hold those in tension. And, and again, he doesn't really say that, but he's, a, he's been very helpful in thinking about that. Um, the second question about the digital, I don't know if I can do full justice to, um, but uh, one of the things I actually think about is the relationship between um, digital phenomena as non-human phenomena uh, that we need to also uh, continue uh, to think about within the realm um, of the human and the post-human. And one more time, just to kind of work to a scholar whose work uh, been really interesting to me. Um, uh, Ashil Mbembe writes about the relationship between post-humanism and two kinds of animisms, right? Um, and animism is, has been associated sort of with classic primitivizing anthropology, um, but also the, animis, uh, the animism of the animism, the animation, the digital animation of life now. Um, and so that there's a link between the technological animation of life uh, and its potent dangers and, and affordance. So it's, a, it's an area that I'm thinking about. Um, Jane, um, what a uh, phenomenal um, uh, question. And I, I had, I had the, the germ of an answer. Uh, <laughs> oh, um, uh, the, the germ of the answer, it, it's maybe had to do with the, the extraction. Right? I'm thinking about different forms of extractive logics. Um, there is a third logic um, uh, that I think is important in some form to bring into these processes. So maybe wrapping thoughts. It started with two cycles of accumulation, right? So there's a cycle of capital accumulation. Then there's a cycle of carbon accumulation. 
and then there's a cycle um, of, of war and of war making. Um, and war as something that is both a process of capital generation or there's a process that is generated by extra extraction and war is a process that depends upon the creation of different forms of life. Uh, and uh, so really the kind of the, if I ever just stop being a, a dean uh, and get to write again, um, the, the actual third volume of this is going to try to think that relationship between the castle and the garden and actually to say it starts there. War making in the Cape and the difference between post-Westphalian European war making between sovereign states that had forms of legal protection and war making between sovereign European states and um, colonial peoples who aren't afforded legal standing and therefore who are endlessly amenable to extraction. Extraction of life, extraction of land, extraction of soil, extraction of cattle, um, extraction of the future. Um, and so that would be sort of a, a third piece. And so the, actually the, the, the um, Khoi Khoi War and the Rebek are really at, at the heart of a locale to think from, uh, to think the future from the Cape. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't have myself on mute and I, I tend to have a running commentary of, uh, of, of sounds. Apologies to, to everyone for that because um, I'm humming and hawing as, you know, as Ian's um, um, making his comments. I want to invite uh, Julian May to in response to um, the discussion, make some kind of closing remarks or observations or even questions. I mean, I think that there's a horizon that is open that one might want to think into um, with new questions together. Thank you, I'll keep it brief. I think the idea of the castle and the garden is a fascinating route to take. Um, and it ties up with the other thing which we haven't mentioned, which is part of that process of, of empire, which essentially is the role of the, of, of, of the pox, of the pandemic, um, which has as much to do with what happened in the Cape um, as, 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 as war itself. So, and, uh, and some reflections, I think at some point on the current situation of pandemics and future pandemics, I think would be um, an interesting line of thought. The second is, you know, the, the talk about UWC and reminded me as, as UWC has always had this strong tradition of activism. And something which I think is of interest to me is in one respect, I made the comment about the futures with us and children are the future, that children do have rights. Um, it's something used a lot by pro-life conservatives um, as in their activism. And I don't think we use it enough in our activism, thinking about not only the right to be born, whether that's, but more the question of the right to have a meaningful life. And that is something we could perhaps think about. And, and certainly one of the things that we have been doing with this work now is working with UWC's Dala Omar Institute to start to think to at what point do we think about litigation, about the right of our children to have a future life um, and an adequately nourished life. So that is something that we could in fact focus more on in, 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 in taking next steps. Thanks for inviting me. I've really greatly enjoyed this, this seminar. Thank you, Julian. And great thanks to, um, to Ian Bochum for, um, for sharing, uh, sharing the introduction of your new book and for the inaugural um, Distinguished Vice Chancellor's Lecture. And thank you, Julian, for um, your really fascinating, important uh, conversation in response to, to Ian's talk. Um, I'd like to hand over to Umesh Bauer, who would like, who will say something about um, the, the next uh, talk and say thank you to colleagues for joining us from far and wide.
Uh, thanks, thanks, Heidi. Uh, firstly, I really want to thank all the participants for engaging uh, in this in this lecture uh, and uh, in the thoughtful way in which uh, they were uh, engaging with our, our our speakers. I want to uh, thank uh, Ian uh, especially, uh, and I hope your flu gets better. Uh, you know, you, was, you initially when we were speaking before the start of the webinar, you thought that you may get woozy and all of that. Uh, I don't think that happened, but so thank you very much for for this really thoughtful uh, uh, sharing. When you when you when you, when you flighted the pictures of the uh, the sea that has uh, receded in in Ghana, uh, it reminded me of the or the uh, the fort at Elmina, where the the last uh, steps from the dungeon onto the ship. And I, I, I was quite moved by what you said, and it reminded me of a, uh, of a visit uh, there in a very quiet time in, in 2000, when uh, walking to the dungeon, I saw a very small wreath that was placed there uh, by uh, a little plastic wreath placed quietly uh, by a, a school and uh, a set of school children who had visited the area and what the uh, the wreath said is uh, with love to our ancestors from the uh, uh, St. Catherine's School for Girls uh, in the UK and I think what 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 that what that reminded me about is that in our conversations here that the the depth of what the emotionality that there is coming across in what seems like numbers, seems like, uh, you know, ordinary things. And, and Julian put this very nicely in, in, a, in, in this moving poem that he shared, that there needs to be a focus also on, on the psychology of, of how the, these endless contestations take place and that the, the agency is not the one that we strongly, from our side, use uh, where, uh, to oppose some of these, some of these forces. Um, our uh, Julian, thank you very much for for uh, the work that you have done in in this in, in, in this webinar. Uh, I also want to just thank Heidi uh, and the CHR uh, Michelle Smith, who uh, ran very strongly in the background. Um, I also want to thank uh, uh, Graham and Susan, and and if you can just uh, show us your picture. Uh, because they did all the hard, they do all the hard work here uh, behind behind the scenes that we uh, appreciate. So please join me in thanking uh, thanking our colleagues. Our next, uh, thank you, Susan, and thank you, uh, Graham. Our next session, uh, the next webinar is planned for six weeks' time, in which we have, uh, and it's to be confirmed, we have the, the presenter, Prof. Hussein Abdullahi Bulhan, who's a uh, a psychologist who initially from uh, taught at Boston University, but is now the uh, rector at the Franz Fanon University in Somaliland, which is the UW which he's a partner with. And he's a former scholar on Franz Fanon and the psychology of oppression. And his recent work is on, on the move and the trend to move from the occupation of land to the occupation of being. And this uh, uh, Ian, you've, you've laid, uh, you and uh, Julian have laid the, the groundwork very nicely that will dovetail into that conversation. And so we'll, 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 we'll share uh, the links for the next webinar. And uh, we look forward to, to all of, uh, all of your, your participation and contribution. Uh, thank you very much. And colleagues, uh, all the best to you. Uh, please be safe. And uh, we look forward to uh, the, next, uh, the, next, uh, the next webinar. Uh, in the series. Thank you very much.